Hey, we're looking at Jesus Christ is our living hope. Jesus Christ is our living hope. And, and the whole idea is Jesus is re resurrected from the dead, so our hope in him is actually alive. Alive. And so I want to develop that. But today I want to look at Christ is our living hope even when we're tested by fire. Okay? That's going to pop up in our text and we'll see it as we go along. So when you're tested by fire, the first thing you need to do is praise God. That is not our inclination at all. When things are not going right in my life, because I'm part of that, get out my phone, take my own picture, selfie generation. <laughs> it's all about me, right? Yeah. I don't go first thing to God and praise Him for when a crisis, a problem, a difficulty, a trial, a test, a temptation comes into my life. That's not where I go first. It's just not where I go. It's hard for us to praise God when things aren't going right. But that's exactly what he says to do first. Praise God. He says, praise Him for His mercy. Mercy is when God gives you, He withholds from you, He actually withholds from you what you rightly deserve. Now, the wage of sin is death, so we rightly deserve to die, and God was merciful, and he said, nope, I'm going to let you live so that you'll have time to experience my grace where I'll give you what you don't deserve, eternal life, if you just call on me to be saved. So we praise him, oh, thank you, God, that you're merciful. Whatever I God does not give us the judgment we're due, but gives us grace, blessings we don't deserve. So you, no matter what's going on in your life, you can praise him and say, you know, it's not as bad as it could be. Thank you, God, that you've been merciful to me. You can thank him for the new birth. What a better time to talk about that than today when we're dedicating babies, right? The whole idea of new birth is that I've accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, and I have been born again. And I'm now a child of God, and God is dealing with me as a child. So things happening in my life are being all worked together for good, whether I like them or not. Now, when I give my little toddler a little swat on the behind to put him in the right direction and frame of mind, he didn't like it. And when God disciplines, sometimes we don't like it either, but he is a loving God dealing with his newborn child, born again child. And I can praise him for that. I'm in the family of God. He's going to take care of me. I can praise him for that. That I have a living hope. I know Jesus Christ who's raised from the dead. I don't serve a dead prophet. I serve the true and living Christ Messiah. For an inheritance, he says, and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil or fade away, it's kept for me in heaven. You know, for me to get my inheritance, what I got to do? I got to die. I'm not going to get that inheritance until I die. Or the Lord comes back and takes me out of this world, right? And so he says, praise God, even in your problems that you've got. And then he says, praise him that he's given you the shield of faith. If I will take up my faith and put my trust in him, then he is going to move into action and protect me. Though, he says, who through faith are shielded by God's power. He's going to put his power as a shield around me. So it says in 1 Corinthians 10, 13, there's no temptation common to, uh, that is not common to man. There's no problem you have that is not common to everyone, but God is faithful and he will not allow you to be tempted or tested or have a problem or a trial beyond what you're able to bear. Wow. And he'll also make a way of escape that you may be able to stand up under it. Wow. I take that shield of faith and I say, you know what? God, I'm in the midst of this fiery trial. I don't like it, but God, I know you'll get me through it if I just trust in you. And he will. And then he says, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. This salvation is the salvation when God actually saves me from the presence of sin and takes me to heaven. You see, I, I got saved when I was eight years old and accepted Jesus as my Savior. He saved me from all, the penalty of sin, all my sin forever. 
And every day when I believe in Jesus, he saves me from the power of sin so that I have faith to overcome these problems in my life as I trust in him. But one day he's going to come back and take me from the presence of sin. We call that salvation. Salvation then, now, and to come. It's all salvation. Praise God for your salvation. And then he turns and he says, rejoice in the Lord. Now, rejoice is different than being happy. Happy means everything is happening like you like it. When everything goes your way, you're happy. But if something doesn't go your way, then you're not happy. It's totally dependent on circumstances. Joy, however, is not dependent on the circumstances. Even when things aren't going right, the Apostle Paul was incarcerated. He's locked up in jail in Philippi. And he's singing from the Old Testament book of Psalms. And he's singing psalms and praising God. He's been beaten and flogged. And he's in stocks. And, he, and there he is in prison. And him and Silas, they're singing the song. And, and, and then they finish one. And, and Silas says, well, I got one better than that. How about Psalm 42? And then they sing Psalm 42. And Paul said, well, I can outdo that. How about Psalm 37? And then they, and they go back and forth. And they're singing songs all night. They've got joy in their heart even though their circumstances are terrible. And so he says here, rejoice. In this you greatly rejoice over trials. Ooh. Over trials. Rejoice. In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. The word trials can mean tests, problems, difficulties, troubles. It's got a wide, wide range of meaning, temptation. You're suffering. He said, you're being tested like by fire. And uh, maybe sometimes it's not a big fire. Maybe it's something like a 1974 AMC Hornet sportabout. That after I graduated out of seminary, well, actually I was in seminary and I got this car. It was just a pain. You ever had a car like that? Let me tell you about this car. I don't know. It had been totaled, and my brother was a body repairman. I should be telling you something already. He put it back together. All right? And so uh, I'm driving this car, everything that could possibly go wrong. So I'm at church, and I decide at lunchtime I'm going to go home. And so I'm driving, and from the church to my house is about two miles away. And uh, I have to go by this little lake. It's a man-made lake. It's actually a valley they dammed up on one end, and they let the, the river or the creek go through it and fill it up. And, but when you go down by the dam, you go down the dip, and you come up the other side, and it was a highway. And so I pull out a church parking lot, and I crank it up because it's a highway. I get down to the bottom of the valley, and I'm going 55, 60, maybe... Some of you know how I drive. So I might have been going a little faster than that, and then all of a sudden, boom, my hood opens up. Did you ever have that experience? You slam on your brakes, and you hope for the best. I, I managed to pull the car over onto the gravel side, uh, uh, the, you know, the, the side uh, where it's all gravel, and I pull it over, and, and I hop out of the car. I try to put that hood down. And I, I get it down, but it won't fully close. So I did what anybody else would do. <laughs> I got up on that thing. I'm jumping up and down on it till I finally get it to latch. And so then I drive home. I get my car. I drive home. I go into the house. I tell my wife. It was my first wife. I said, good thing we don't own a gun. I'd go out and shoot that car. So then I go out because I'm now going to just check the hood out and I'm trying to, it won't open. It won't open. And I know it overheats a little bit, so I got a jug of, of water, you know, old uh, uh, milk bottle, and I fill it up with water instead, and I throw it in the car, and I'm heading back to church because I need to really check it, but I got to get back to church because I had an appointment. I'll check it after my appointment. And so I'm heading back to church. I'm doing that same place. I'm going down that valley at the exact same spot. I'm looking and say, aha, then boom, it happened all over again. My hood goes popping open, and I'm slamming on my brakes. Now I'm on the opposite side of the road. Skid marks on both sides, okay? I pull over to the side of the road. I get out. 
I push that hood back down again. Of course, it won't stop. I mean, it won't shut right. And so what do I do? There it is. Crazy Baptist preacher. Parishioners are driving by. They see their pastor dancing on the top of the hood of his car. Believe me, I heard about that next Sunday. <laughs> Our crazy pastor. Got in the car, drove to church. So a little while later, I take this car. I'm with my son. He's a, he's a preschooler, so he's about four because he hadn't entered into school yet. And I take him to the bank with me. And we're in bank, and I'm standing with the teller. And my, there's, a, a, there's a, on the PA, it says, uh, there's a station wagon in the parking lot on fire. <laughs> my son grabs my pants and said, Dad, Dad, we've got a station wagon. I said, no, 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 I have a hatchback. You know, I said, it's a, it's a sport about hatchback. So I go out, and sure enough, Smoke is just rolling out from underneath the hood of the car. So I get a stick, because I don't know if there's fire, and I'm trying to do that latch. This latch is a problem, finally. I have to I'll peel it if it's hot. And I finally, I pop the hood open, and uh, sure enough, it's my car that's on fire, because none of the others. And, and it's not really on fire. The vacuum line, the rubber hose, had broken, and it went across the alternator and was shorting everything out and it was melting down all the wires. So it was a white smoke from rubber burning in uh, on my car. And so I'm, I'm a poor guy. I, I, you know, I got, I got two kids already, and I just got my first job, or I'm a second one actually, but I'm new at the church, and, and, I, and I, I got moving expense, I got all this, so I can't afford it. So I drive down to the Ace Hardware and buy a roll of black electrician's tape, and I wrapped every wire. <laughs> I drove that car with wrapped wires. Now, you think that this car, it's winter time. It's winter time in Ohio. Ohio sometimes gets colder than here. You know that. It's like 20 below zero. And my folks were with us, and I said to my dad, I said, you know, the weather, I think I need to check. I need to check my antifreeze. I said, I got an antifreeze ch checker in the back of my hatchback. And so I said, we just got to go out and get it. So it's cold out. It's so cold. And I went out and I put the key in, turned it to pull up that hatch and uh, it's not budging. Well, you know what happens, the moisture and condensation and then it freezes. So the rubber is frozen. So I said, dad, I, I can do this. Uh, I, I turned the key, put my foot on the bumper and I gave it a yank. I mean, a jerk. I mean, I just pulled that thing and I ripped, I ripped I ripped the tailgate right off of the car. And I looked at my dad and I said, Dad, I'm sure glad you're here because nobody's going to believe I ripped this off. <laughs> the hinges were made out of aluminum. And aluminum at that cold temperature is just so brittle, they just snapped. So now I'm holding this in my hands. And so the next day I go to the hardware store and I bought, you ever seen the barn hinges? You know, the big long part? And I drilled holes through the roof, and I drilled holes through that, and I put bolts through that, and I, I got that hatch working again. But you ever have trials? I said, what do you do when you got a car like that? My friend said to me, you sell it. <laughs> you sell it. Oh, my goodness. You know, those are problems and trials. But I think, I think Peter is preparing his readers for the next emperor who's coming whose name is Nero. And Nero is going to make, and he's going to persecute, and he's going to outlaw Christianity, he's going to persecute them, he's going to feed them to the lions, and in this painting, uh, I don't remember who painted it, but in this painting, you can see he's got Christians being crucified in the arena, Christians that are going to be devoured, and in the distance you've got Christians who are being lit up after being crucified. I think he's preparing the readers for the fact that, hey, persecution is coming. You think you got trials now, wait till they really arrive. We have everyday trials, and everyday trials, Jesus is there for us. But listen, he's there for us for the big trials too. He's going to be there for the big trials too. Your hope is in the Lord when you are in these trials. These trials, these have come. These have come. And he says, rejoice. 
because there's a reward that's attached with your trial. These have come that your faith that I will put my trust in God, not in my selfie shot of who I am. I don't put my my trust in myself. I put my trust in the Lord. And he says, that faith is of greater worth than gold. Notice what he says, which perishes. All the gold's going to eventually perish. You see, I've read my Bible and I know this world's going to be dissolved and everything in it. That is the gold. It's going to be gone. He says, even if the gold's been refined by fire, it may prove genuine, that your faith might prove genuine and may result in praise and glory and honor to God. (laughs) He allows the difficult things in my life so that I might bring the praise, the honor, and glory to God by saying, God, I trust you to get me through it. To get me through it. He says, rejoice over your trials, rejoice over the reward, rejoice over the second coming. Uh, He says here, these have come, they're better than gold, and they may result in praise and glory and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed, when Christ returns for us. When Christ returns for us. A little later in this book, we're going to read how the Old Testament prophets were anticipating Jesus' first coming. We are anticipating Jesus his second coming. And it seemed like he was never going to get here in the Old Testament. And some of us feel like he's never going to get here in the New Testament. But the fact is, he did come the first time in fulfillment of all the promises he made. And he is coming a second time. And we look forward to it. It's the day of our reward. Great reward. Great reward. He's coming back again. He's coming back again. He says, rejoice over your love. He says, though you have not seen him, you love him. I love the Lord. My love is so shallow. (laughs) When I compare it to his great love, my love is so shallow. But I love the Lord. I love the Lord. I haven't seen him and I love him. Remember Thomas? Thomas believed because he saw him because that's the next one. Rejoice over your faith that you believe in him that you haven't even seen. And when Thomas, you know, uh, wasn't there when Jesus appeared and he said, oh, unless I put my hand in, in put my finger in the hand, in his holes in his hand and put my, my hand in the side, I won't believe. And then he appeared the second time and Thomas was there. And he said, oh, my Lord, my God. Jesus said, you are blessed, Thomas, because you have seen and believed. But blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. That's us. We're more blessed than Thomas. And he hung out with Jesus for a few years. When we believe, he says, rejoice that you can still believe in the Son of God even when you're going through a trial. They can't take that away from you. They can't take your faith away from you. My mom used to always say about my education, she'd say, Dennis, you want to get as much education as you can because that's one thing they can never take away from you. They can take your car, they can take your house, they can take just about, but they can't take your education away. Listen to me. They can't take your faith away. They can't. They can't. He says then, here it is, and are filled with inexpressible and glorious joy. That's why the Apostle Paul and Silas could be singing those hymns even though they got their feet in stocks and they're in chains and they're bound in prison and they've been beaten for Jesus. And he says, with an inexpressible, glorious joy, I'm doing this for the Lord. It's not for the moment, for the selfie. It's for Him. It's for eternity. And He takes great joy in that. And he says after saying that, over that great joy. For you are receiving the goal of your faith, the salvation of your soul. It's not about the body. It's about your spirit and your soul for all eternity. Rejoice that you are saved. You know the Lord. You've accepted him as your savior. This point, he says, let's reflect upon the salvation a little bit. I praise the Lord because I'm saved. I rejoice because I'm saved. He said, now concerning this salvation, the prophets who spoke of the grace that was to come to you 
They searched intently with the greatest care. They were investigating the salvation in the whole Old Testament. They kept looking for him. Uh, Genesis 3.15, where, where, where the Protevangelium, the very first gospel, that a Messiah is going to come and crush the head of Satan and deliver all mankind. Go to Genesis 12. God promises a seed, the seed of Abraham. Through him all the nations of the earth will be blessed. You go to Isaiah 53 and he talks about it there. He, you just go through the whole Old Testament. And they were investigating what is this Messiah going to be like? And not only that, when is he going to come? Trying to find out the time and the circumstances. When is he coming? And then this whole thing has been predicted to which the Spirit of, God, the Spirit of Christ in the prophets pointing them when he predicted this predicted salvation. I'm sorry about that. I've got to fix this microphone somehow. They predicted his suffering. They predicted his suffering. If we're following in his steps, believe me, you're going to have trial and trouble and tribulation. You're going to go through the fire. You're going to suffer as he suffered. The suffering of Christ, they were looking into that, but also the glories that would follow. Isaiah 53, it's like Isaiah is at the scene of the cross he says, all we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way, but the Lord laid on him the iniquity of all, us all. Paul says the same thing in 2 Corinthians 5, 7, uh, 5, 21. God made him to be sin for us, the one who knew no sin, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. He's saying, listen, there's suffering first. But then it says, God made his soul an offering for sin in Isaiah 53, 10. And then it says he is going to see his seed again, the resurrection of Jesus, and that there's going to be glory to follow. Man, they were looking for that, and they had hope through all the difficulties they went through. He says, you have hope in Jesus Christ through his sufferings and his glory. Put your hope in Jesus. That's what he says, but you, you, he turns to you. When they spoke these things, that have now been told to you by those who preach the gospel. I just told them to you. I'm the preacher of the gospel. When they told you those things by the Holy Spirit who was sent from heaven, even the angels are longing to look into these things. They look with great anticipation of what Jesus is going to do next. I think those angels were always beholding the face of God. We read that verse earlier today. They were watching today. And seeing each one of these little ones, that angel was saying, hey, that's my kid. <laughs> I'm assigned to him. Right in the presence of God, looking down, you know. And it says, angels are looking in. We never see them. They're invisible spirit beings. But I guarantee you, they're looking in on what's going on here today. What is God going to do next in your life and your angel saying, I can't wait to see what God is going to do next in my person's life. He goes on and he says, they preach the gospel. The gospel. The gospel is this. According to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, that Christ died for our sins, he was buried, and on the third day he rose again from the dead. And that is our hope. Our hope is in Jesus Christ, who is alive from the dead. And we praise him, we rejoice in him, and we enjoy his salvation. Here's what we do. When tested by the fire, we praise the Lord, we rejoice in the Lord and we reflect on our salvation. This is not all there is. There's going to be oh so much more. Remember, Jesus is our living hope. Don't go to yourself doing a little selfie there. I notice that women don't use compacts anymore. You know, flip out that mirror. Had a lady in my church in Philadelphia. She went to the bank. She'd banked there her whole life. The teller knew her, knew him by name. And then bank policy changed. Bank policy said that you had to ask for identification with every check. She didn't bring any identification in. She said, the teller says she knows her the whole life. I have to see some identification. She said, what? You know who I am. No, company policy. I got to see some identification. So she reached into her purse. She pulled out her compact. She flipped it over and looked at herself in the mirror and said, yep, it's me. (laughs) 
We are a selfie generation. We turn the camera on, we look at ourselves, it's all about me, all about me, all about me. God, why are you letting this happen? Because it's all about me, it's all about me, all about me. Peter is saying it's not about you at all. It's all about him. All about him. When life is tough, you know, a thousand little fires can do as much damage as one big fire. My car, every time, I could tell you more stories about that car. <laughs> a thousand little things can be more irritating than one big thing. Everything has been a sign of the Lord. He works everything together for good. Joseph said this to his brothers who intended to harm him. You meant it to me for evil or harm, but God meant it for good. We have a living hope in Jesus Christ that he is going to bring everything together to good ultimately and in the end. Don't forget that. This was our memory verse a couple months ago. I put it back up because it says, The Lord your God is with you. He is mighty to save. He will take great delight in you. And he will quiet you with his love. He will rejoice over you with singing. Oh my goodness. This is an incredible faith we have because we have an incredible God. We have an incredible God. Let's pray. Father in heaven, this has been a glorious Lord's Day. We've presented children unto you and parents who've dedicated themselves unto raising their children for the glory of God. We've looked into your word and we've seen that we have a living hope. Our Savior is alive and when we pray in Jesus' name, our live Savior hears us. He intercedes with the Father for us. Thank you, O oh God, that you hear our prayers even when we pray nonsense, he fixes them and presents them to you. We thank you, O oh God, that you hear us, you hearken to us, you hear our voice, you answer us. And you sustain us, you save us, you get us through our fires, our, our trials, our difficulties, our problems. Lord, we thank you. And then on top of all of that, you sing over us. You sing a song over us because you love us. Thank you, God, for loving me. Thank you for loving these people. May we love you back, O oh God. This I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.